How to maximize your profits in your Airbnb short-term rental is the topic for today's episode. You are listening to the Champion Hustle Podcast. Play to succeed in business and in life. Featuring Levi Hunsaker and Ryan Black. Hello and welcome to the Champion Hustle Podcast. This is episode number 25. My name is Ryan Black. And my name is Levi Hunsaker. And we welcome you guys out today to today's episode. This is an incredible strategy and we are joined by a really special guest. But before we dive into that, I want to give a quick shout out, remind you guys about our seven day quick start boot camp, absolutely free, available to you on our website at championhustle.com. Seven full days of incredible training. So go sign up and get that and uh, you will be grateful. <laughs> it is incredible <laughs> training and it will help you and help your business absolutely free. So. Levi, good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon, Ryan. I cannot tell you guys how excited about this topic I I am. Like this is this is one of my favorite strategies and we have a good friend of ours, Connor Simmons joining us today. And Connor actually works at the same company that I do right now. And so um let's give you a little bit of his background. Connor is a, a, a mechanical engineer. He actually went to Utah State University, same place that I went to, and so we share a lot in common there. Um, but Connor's strategy for investing is fantastic, and, and yeah. he's going to break that down for you today. But basically what he does is um, he does a modified buy uh, a burr method. For those of you guys, we're not going to go through it, the details of of the burr, but it's a modified burr method where he actually uses Airbnb to maximize his profits. And so as of today, he has seven short-term rentals uh, active, but by the end of 2020, which is less than a month away, <laughs> there will be 11 operating. So Connor's going to stand up four short-term rentals this month alone. And so that's why we brought him in here to talk about the strategy because he is just killing it. Yeah, welcome, Connor. Good to have you with us today. Great. Hey, thank you so much, guys. I'm excited to be here. So one thing before we dive into the to the meat and potatoes, I want to clarify. We are going to be using the term short-term rental. It's kind of like everyone calls uh, facial tissues Kleenex, right? Because Kleenex is like the recognizable <laughs> brand name, but they're really facial tissues. They're not Kleenex. Kleenex is the brand. Airbnb is a marketplace that simply allows people to find, but it's so ubiquitous that everyone, most people, especially people who aren't investors, refer to short-term rentals as Airbnbs. So we're not really going to be using that term much, Airbnb. They are short-term rentals because there are lots of different marketplaces where you can list short-term rentals, Airbnb simply being one of those. So just want to make sure you guys understand that so you're not confused like, why do they never say Airbnb? Because it's simply a marketplace. <laughs> we're talking about the strategy in general, not one specific place where you can list your properties. And I'm sure that Connor, your properties are listed on Airbnb, but uh, maybe not necessarily exclusively. And uh, yeah, so we just want to make sure we're using the right terminology. Yeah, thanks so, for clarifying. And I'll I'll even use them interchangeably uh, depending on who I'm talking to, because you know that on the head, many people do get confused when I say short term rentals. They're like, what does what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, yeah, confused look. So. It's, uh, we just wanted to clarify. So can you, to kick it off, Connor, why don't you kind of dive into, you know, what is a short-term rental? What is, what, how does that differ from, you know, like a, a traditional rental property? Yeah, so the best comparison is uh, comparing it to a hotel, right? Um, the nice thing is, is they are entire homes. And so it's kind of a blend of, um, I guess, more of a condo where you get to show up, uh, you get the full kitchen, the bathroom, you get the whole house to yourself. Um, you can rent them by the room. Um, but the nice thing is, is typically even they share the kitchen with the host. And so it makes it really nice for you as a traveler to get to come into a short-term rental um, and you pay similar to what you would pay to stay at a hotel, but you get a lot better, um, I guess, amenities. Uh, and oftentimes they'll come with you know, in, in cool resorts where you've got swimming pools and hot tubs. Uh, and sometimes it's just a basic house, but again, it's a huge advantage to you because you're going to come in and you can prepare your own meals, especially if you're staying long-term, uh, can really save you uh, a lot of money in that, in that sense. 
Yeah, I love, I, I mean, we've done a lot of traveling and we, I mean, hands down prefer to stay in short-term rentals, especially if we're with the kids, right? Because nobody wants to have to grab a couple of hotel rooms and it's just, it's a mess. So yeah, the short-term rentals, more and more so over the last few years, more and more people are going to that. People use it for business purposes. People use it for, you know, for leisure. And um, so how did, you, how did you get started in, you know, in short-term rentals and, and all that? Oh man, that's such a great question. It's kind of a it's kind of a long story. I'll try and keep it brief. Um, I was actually doing one of doing one of my first flips, um, and in the basement of this flip, there was a, a basement entrance, and there was this unused space. Um, and I got looking at this flip, and I was like, you know, you could really easily convert this into a non-conforming duplex. Um, this property was extremely close to um, the Salt Lake City International Airport, and so. I just, uh, I had been studying and learning about a lot of different real estate strategies. And I was like, you know, this is in a different neighborhood than what a typical short-term rental would be. And typically um, it's more of a vacation destination. Uh, but I was going for a little bit of a different market. I started talking to some people and I met um, some awesome friends, um, the Havens, and they have an, a, an amazing short-term rental business, uh, management business, I should say. And I, I was working with them and they came and looked at the property and they thought it would do awesome. And so instead of flipping and selling that house, I flipped it and kept that house. Um, and that house alone cash flows anywhere from $1,500 to $2,000 in cash flow, right? A month. And so nice. that was my first Boom. taste of it. <laughs> yeah, it was my first taste of it. And I just kind of honestly stumbled into it as, as I compared long-term rentals in that area. Um, one thing that I love about short-term rentals is um, how well my units are maintained. They're professionally cleaned two to three times a week. Um, kind of a fun story. We just had it appraised. That property, we set it up about almost two years ago now. Um, we appraised it about three months ago. And the appraiser walked in. He's like, oh, wow, you guys just finished remodeling this. It doesn't look like you've had any <laughs> renters yet. And I just, you know, we started laughing. I'm like, yeah, nope, it's been rented for a year and a half. And he's like, what? This place looks pristine. Um, and especially in that neighborhood, I'll admit it's a little bit of a rougher neighborhood. So to throw long-term renters in there, um, you know, it would, be a, it would be rough, for lack of a better term. So just out of curiosity, if you were to do a traditional long-term rental strategy and, and you've run in this as a duplex, right? Yep. Okay. So just making sure we're talking about the property I'm thinking about. Um, if you were to do a traditional long-term rental with traditional tenants, usually 12 month leases, what a net profit would you bring in, be bringing in per month on this property? Yeah, and that's a great question that everybody should know the answer to if they are setting up uh, an Airbnb or a short-term rental because, um, you know, for whatever reason, if a short-term rental does have hiccups or it doesn't work out, you want exit strategies, right? And so um, I do know what my long-term rentability would be on all of my properties. Uh, this property, we would still have a strong cash flow of about $500 a month, um, but $500 a month versus 1500 to 2000 in my opinion, it's a no brainer. <laughs> so think, three to 400% increase. Yeah. Exactly. That's incredible. So, and yeah, it's, it's, it, and, and it's a lot of fun. It's, and it feels like I'm providing a good value to people. Um, our reviews are phenomenal. So it really is, um, I don't know, more entertaining, I guess, than just a simple long-term renter. Yeah. 2000 Sweet. is a bigger number than 500. Last time I checked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Carry so the one. <laughs> one one thing, and I've I've had the opportunity to you know to hang out with you, Connor, and and actually walk through where you've given me some tours and things of of some of your properties that you're working on. And one thing that I like is several of the ones that I've seen. Um, they're in neighborhoods that maybe traditionally might not be as I mean they're not like bad. You know, there wasn't a drive-by shooting while we were there, but they're they're neighborhoods <laughs> where um, you know they're not. It would be maybe a little bit more difficult to find a traditional tenant or even a buyer for, for the property, right? It's not right. maybe the most desirable neighborhood. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Because, um, you know, there are some awesome benefits with short-term rentals to being able to pick up properties in neighborhoods where people maybe <laughs> wouldn't want to be otherwise, and you can cash flow the living daylights out of them. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll talk about our local market here. It, it is really important to know the neighborhood you're going into. Um, for example, in, in 
where the neighborhoods I'm in, I'm in the neighborhoods of what's called Rose Park and Poplar Grove. Uh, the important thing is they still share a Salt Lake City zip code. So if you're flying in from wherever, right, you're coming from California or New York and you're flying in and you see that it's the Salt Lake City zip code, you're, you're happy, you're excited. Um, like you said, they're not, they're not like scary neighborhoods. There's not a bunch of creepy people walking around, um, but they are, um, I'm going to call them diverse. They're, they're very diverse neighborhoods. And, um, and so because of that, we can go in and find a lot of these homes at steep discounts. And that's a huge part of my strategy is I buy homes that I can flip. Um, for those that are familiar with the Burr method, that's what I'm doing. I'm buying them and then I'm renovating them. Um, and so when I can go into these neighborhoods and get them at big discounts and still get similar Airbnb rents to those in downtown, um, both my, or let's see, five of my units are within five minutes of downtown Salt Lake. Um, and same with within five minutes to the Salt Lake City International Airport. Um, so we can get these big discounts. Um, but another example is, is if I cross um, certain city lines, right? So if I wander over into West Valley City, that's a neighboring city to Salt Lake City, um, my air ter- my my short term, I combine words there. Air term, Airbnb and short term. <laughs> um, but if I go into West Valley, my short term rentals will not perform over there, simply because travelers see that it's further away. Um, and frankly, they can even Google you know West Valley City, and it has some negative or um, I don't know what you'd say. Some it's a little less desirable, I guess you'd say. And so, uh, but when they're coming into into Salt Lake City, they're happy that they're just close to to downtown right okay yeah so um just out of curiosity how long have you been doing this strategy oh man i picked up that first property i think it was in november of 2018 and we had it up and rented in march or april of 2019 so only a year and a half two years so almost two years yep two years that's awesome and it's and we've gone from those first two units, right? So when I say I have 13 doors, um, that's across duplexes, triplexes, and a condo. Um, and we've been able to pick all of those up in the last 18 months um, and just went under contract. So I'm at 13 by the end of the year and we'll close on a triplex on January 31st. So we'll be up to 16 moving into next year, assuming Boom. it's under contracts. So we don't know what happens there, but... Um, I, I'd say we got a pretty good shot of picking that one up too. Still, just never stop, never stop moving. Don't, don't stop. <laughs> yeah, Con- Connor is the consummate definition of hustle. That guy's yeah. always hustling. I I like to think so. It's I'm excited for it to no longer be a side hustle. It's going to be the full time hustle here sooner than later. So. Yeah, but you're doing it right. I mean, you're, you're working as a mechanical engineer, putting food on the table, providing for the family while you're building your business on the side, building out your portfolio, investing. And so, you know, slowly as you transition from one to the other, it'll, uh, yeah, it'll replace it. So that's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. So another question for you, Connor, um, in your investing with the short term rentals, is this something that you primarily do by yourself or do you have partners, uh, you know, that are involved on those transactions? How do you structure that? Is that? Such, <clears throat> that is a very important question. Um, and I'm even going to throw a question out there that I can answer myself, I guess, is how, how is it that I'm able to um, duplicate this? Uh, and it is because of partners. Uh, every single one of my properties except one um, I have a partner on, which means I only have 50% ownership in, right? And some people um, frown upon that. They're like, oh, well, you only own 50%. Would even... I've had one guy that's like, well, that means you only own seven and a half properties then, but you own 13, or I guess that'd be six and a half. I can math. Um, <clears throat> but what's cool about it is you people, when you're buying homes, you're very limited on how many homes you can buy. Um, and unless you get into really creative financings, but go and buy, you know, your more run of the mill financing, you can only have up to 10 mortgages in your name. Right. So that in and of itself limits me to 10 homes. And I did not like that. I did not want to be limited. Um, I want to have a hundred doors. Uh, and so I, I wanted to think of a way that I could um, multiply. Uh, and that's where I found this modified Burr method. Um, the first property we did, we left a lot of money in it. We just refinanced it and pulled a lot of that money out of it. 
but that first property, you know, was like 60 or $70,000 uh, between my partner and I that we had to leave tied up in the property. And um, I don't know about you guys, but if I want to buy a hundred properties and I have to leave 60 or $70,000 in every one of them, it's going to take me a long, long time. And so what I do, um, are you guys okay if I dive real quick in, into the yeah. strategy? Because I'm, yeah, I'm more absolutely. than happy to share Let, it. Let's jump in. Let's go deep, as deep as you want to go. Cool. So um, if you can't tell, I get real excited about this. So <laughs> uh, just because this is, this is my baby. And, and what's fun about it, guys, is I, I want people to go do this because it works. Um, so what I do is I go out and I find a home that I can flip. Okay. So for example, I'll go out and find a home. Let's say I buy one. Let's use the numbers of that house you saw, Ryan. Um, we bought the home for $240,000. Um, I put about $40,000 of rehab into it. It was a triplex, um, in, in Salt Lake city. So we were about $40,000 into it. Um, but then this is the really cool part of my strategy is I actually already have end buyers. So I have a credit partner that is ready to come in and buy my property. Now these credit partners, this strategy isn't for everybody. These credit partners are typically, um, for lack of a better term, they're well off um, and they're busy. So um, two of my best partners are three. I've got three. So one's an engineer, um, one's a CFO. That was intimidating. Um, <laughs> and then one was a, and one is a lawyer, right? And so, um, and talking about talking about contracts again, that was intimidating. And so, but <laughs> yeah, so no what kidding. was so cool is these guys are they're they're all very busy in their careers, um, but roughly they have an extra eighty to hundred thousand dollars a year in cash that they wanted to invest. They wanted to diversify, but at the same time they were way too busy to go out and do all the hustle that I'm doing. And so what I do is I go, I find the property. So I, I bought this one for two forty put about 40 grand into it. And we ended up selling that property for $370,000. Um, and so I made a nice about $70,000 uh, flipping the home, which, you know, I, I need the money to live on. Right. And then I took some of that money and reinvested it into the property. Cause see, it's, it's a clean transaction. They bought that house from me 100%. But now I take some of that money, for example, like $10,000, and I give them that $10,000 back to buy back 50% of the property. So now I've got 50% equity in this property. Um, but I will tell you that I do have to give them a little bit more of the cash flow. Cause think about this guys, they're putting up the credit, they're putting up the cash. Um, I'm putting in 10 grand, but I'm making anywhere on my flips from 30 to 70 grand. So I'm buying these homes for negative dollar amounts. Okay. <laughs> negative. I've, I've, of course my first ones weren't like this cause I was fine tuning, but now, um, I'm, I'm netting a negative amount when I buy the home. Um, but the reason why they're so interested is I'm giving them set. It depends. It's all negotiable 50 to 75% of the cash flow, but I'm getting 50% of the equity, which means I catch all the appreciation. Um, and so they come in, they, buy it and they do nothing. I just send them money every month. They love it because it's a very passive um, business for them. And I love it because uh, I have Airbnb management at the Havens. I mentioned them earlier. They're really the ones that are responding to all the Airbnb questions and concerns. Uh, you know, people asking where the toilet paper is at 2 a.m. It's under the sink. Okay. Look under the sink guys. If you're ever in the Airbnb. All right. Just do us all a favor. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, they, they deal with all that. So it really becomes pretty hands off for me. Um, I do take a lot of pride in keeping my properties top notch. And so, uh, I'm on site on most of my properties, like once a month, just looking through, I'm kind of doing an inventory, uh, not so much an inventory, but uh, kind of an audit, making sure everything's looking good. Um, if there's a major emergency, you know, somebody has an issue with something, we had a washing machine go out a couple months ago. I get it taken care of that day. Um, there's been a couple of times where I'm there doing it because I want to keep people happy. So, um, it's a little bit of a hustle for me, but I'm making money buying houses and then I'm making money renting houses. Win-win. You just, that is incredible. <laughs> what you just shared, like listeners go back and rewind the last five minutes and listen to it again. <laughs> that was gold. I, that is a very I, I, creative strategy. 
and I'll add to it, guys. I, I, that there's a, there's a lot of stuff to still learn. So don't just go out and try and do this, um, without really studying what you're doing. Uh, but man, if I could have had that laid out for me 18 months ago, I'd probably be at a hundred doors right now. Um, but because for me, it's been a step-by-step process, uh, it's been it's been hard to get to this point, and and that's why we do these podcasts is to educate you guys. Um, and so go go study this and and take action. That's the biggest. I don't I don't know if I'm supposed to really go into this, but in my experience, if you don't take action, you're never going to succeed. Um, and that's what it's been. That's why I feel like I've been so successful. I've had to do a lot of learning along the way. You'll never know it all, but if you're out taking action things just kind of fall into place as you're, as you're doing. So that right there, that number one tip that Connor just shared is you can learn anything you want, but until you go take action on what you just learned, it's kind of useless. It, it may be fun to know, but it's putting it into action that actually makes it really valuable. Yeah. So whether yeah. you were supposed to go into it or not, I think it's awesome. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. So, so you mentioned the only way that you've been able to scale your business. I mean, the fact that you're, you're putting four doors into practice this or active, I guess is the right word. You're putting four doors active this month and likely going to be doing another three doors in the first quarter of next year. So the fact that you've been able to do have partners to scale that business, well, the next question is, well, how do you find these partners? How are you finding your partners? That is that such a great question. Um, they're not easy to come by. I'll tell you that uh, up front. I am a huge, it's a very simple, it's a very simple strategy. I'm a huge believer in the three foot rule. So everywhere I go and everyone I talk to, my neighbors, my friends, they, and, and I'm not overbearing about it, right? But I want everybody to know that I'm a real estate investor. Um, and I, because of that, I have countless people that take interest in what I'm doing. Um, and then the second thing is that I truly believe in creating value for people. Um, one of my favorite books is The Go-Giver. Uh, and he talks about just provide value unconditionally. And by me providing value to these customers, um, I am extremely confident that as we get their portfolios up and going, um, one of them, I have a contract that we are, we have to buy multiple houses. I don't know what houses we're buying yet, but we're buying multiple houses together. And, um, as I do that, I'm very confident that they are going to see the value when I'm sending them checks every single month and a report on how things are performing. And that's all they have to do. Um, they're going to tell their friends. And frankly, that's how I've, I found most of these uh, customers so far, customers, clients, partners, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, because they have heard from people that I have created value for uh, through, through real estate investing. And so uh, that's, that's my main avenue on finding my, my partners right now. So I, I love that, that you are focused on giving the value first creating a win for them first and then it's all referrals and word of mouth after that that is so important people are willing to listen to someone else's experience i i mean it's it's crazy i've i've heard people that you know go to the doctor and the doctor tells them to do something and they're more willing to listen to their two best friends they're going to tell them some something completely opposite oh no don't do that i've heard terrible things about it don't take that medication even though the doctor has the training, you're going to listen to your best friends because they have the rapport, the relationship with you and the trust. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say, you know, when, when I pitch this to um, this, the attorney, the first guy that comes to my mind, when I pitch this to him, he's just like, so you want me to buy the house and give up 50% of my, of, of my equity in the home? Um, when you look at it that way, this is a terrible investment for my partners, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm going to be very honest. I get a lot of people that are like, dude, that is not a good idea. Um, and then I start to explain to them all the value adds, you know, um, the fact that I can find properties. Um, this, is a, this is a huge value add for people. 
um, one of them, so the CFO, I'll tell you about him real quick. They, him and his wife bought a duplex. They, they put $125,000 down and um, it cash flows 300 bucks a month. That's not very good. That's, no. that is a terrible return. Um, but I'm going to be honest, people that don't do real estate investing, they don't know better. They don't know how to find the kind of rental properties that perform really, really well. And so they're coming in, um, we're, we're closing in like a week and a half on a property with them. And this property will cash flow about $1,400 a month. Um, and I'm giving them 75% of the cash flow. So their cash flow is going to be about $1,000 a month. Um, and they're only putting about $80,000 down. So let's think about the two investments. They made $125,000, but they bought it all to themselves. They're only getting 300 bucks a month or they're getting, they're putting $80,000 down to get a thousand dollars a month, three times, almost four times the return. Um, but yet they're still giving me a piece of that. And it's because I'm creating value. There's, there's so much value out there to be, to be had. Um, you just have to learn how to, to work it and make sense for both parties. Then plus one is worth more than two. <laughs> that that is with the right, incredible. When it's with the right people. With the right people, absolutely. And I would even argue that one plus one can be worth less than two um, if, if you do it wrong, right? And so you really want to you know, understand, how do I say this? You wanna make sure that people are providing you value. Um, and so that's what I do is I put myself in their shoes and I think to myself, okay, how is it that I would be willing to go into this kind of um, joint venture or partnership? Yeah. That is you... another gold nugget, folks. So. Make sure you go back and listen to that because putting yourself in someone else's shoes and giving them what they are looking for, that's the way to get anything that you want. Yeah. The follow-up question I had for you, Connor, was, you know, you're talking about your, your partnerships. As far as structuring those and ensuring that the terms are clear, that everyone's on the same page, there's no misunderstandings, there's no assumptions, right? And, uh, and that everyone's interests are, are legally protected so that there's, you know, no issues whatsoever. Uh, can you give us a little information on, on kind of how you approach that to ensure that things are done all above the board? Yes. So first and foremost, um, this might not be traditional advice, but first and foremost, I will only do a deal with somebody that I trust. Um, I, will, I will go in and sit down with them. Most of my partners are more like lifelong friends or friends of friends that I've known for a long time. And people think, well, my, my circle's too small, but it's not, you know, a lot more people than you think you do. Um, now I am starting to venture out of that a little bit more, but before I go into anything, I only do deals with people that I trust. And on the opposite, I make sure that I'm trustworthy in everything that I do, because if I have one deal that goes south, what happens to my reputation? Right. And so yeah. you got to be trustworthy and you've got to, and you want to work with people that you trust. Now, the next thing is never do anything unless it's in writing and it's agreed to and it's signed. Okay. Because, um, <laughs> your I, business can be, I'll be honest, sometimes things don't go as planned. Right. And so, yeah. um, I have been very, very fortunate where it's gone better than planned, I guess. Um, but absolutely make sure that you have everything in writing. And so, um, I do, I have, a um, Co Cody Backus is my attorney. Um, he's the one that helped me set up my, I have two different businesses because the way my strategy there, there are some very important legalities as to how I move the money and I buy the property and then I sell the property and then I buy 50% ownership. Um, and I have to do that using two different businesses. Right. And so I have it all set up by an attorney. Um, and it was really fun actually working with this, this attorney that I've recently met. Um, I was a little like, I guess, concerned, you know, like, Oh, it's the second attorney's eyes, you know, and he looked everything over and he's like, dude, this looks good. And that, that gave me peace of mind. And I'll be honest. I think the reason he is, he's the one that wants to do multiple deals with me. Um, I think the reason is, is because he sees that everything is structured, set up and legal. Um, that it makes him interested in, in doing it with me because, because <clears throat> again, I'm doing it right. There's no weird stuff going on. So, um, 
Yeah, but biggest thing is make sure everything is right in writing and signed or agreed upon. It gives you credibility, right? It shows that you're taking your business seriously and that uh, you know, we're not talking about small numbers here. These are big numbers, big assets, big investments. So cool. Yeah. Plus a, a bonus tip. <laughs> yeah. Ha you get a free second opinion by having an attorney as a partner. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. I will, I will tell you, he had a few opinions, right? So it was, he was really happy with how it was all set up, but as would in any, in any industry, he had a few uh, suggestions. Um, and I absolutely took them right. And, and, and implementing them. So, it's kind of fun, but it is, it's pretty crazy guys. Like I, if you were to even ask me this a year ago that I'd be asking people for a hundred thousand dollars and for their credit, I just wouldn't have seen how that was feasible. Um, and trying to compare that in any business guys, you, you, you think you're a little fish now, right? You think, Oh, that's going to be hard to get there, but start thinking about that now thinking about, okay, how am I going to provide enough value in the future? to where I can confidently ask somebody for a hundred thousand dollars and they're going to look at it and say, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So we're, we're getting close to the end of our time, but there are some very important questions we want to wrap up with. So the first question is what are some of the pitfalls that as people are going out and looking at, to do this kind of strategy for themselves, what should they avoid? Bad contractors. Um, no, as I, as you're flipping houses, it, it can be very difficult to, uh, to coordinate, um, the rehab. So make sure you don't just run out and do this, learn about how, how to work with contractors. Um, be picky about your contractors. Don't always go with the cheapest. Um, I've had to fire contractors. I've had lawsuits threatened against me. Um, not, you know, fortunately I, I had all my ducks in a row so that they couldn't, um, and so you just have to learn, uh, what you're doing. So that's first. And then, um, trying to think what other pitfalls, um, I would say, you know, clear communication with whether it's with your contractors, your partners, uh, cause there's been a couple of times where there's just little details that I'll forget about, right? Like just we're furnishing the place and I anticipate it's going to be $10,000 and we end up going up to $12,000. I don't think much of it. I tell my partner, hey, you now have to pay $6,000 because it's you know 50-50 in the furnishing. And they're like, well, you told me five. And I'm like, well, that's not a big deal. But did I keep my word to what we pre-agreed upon? Mm -hmm. We, I, I didn't. And so clear communication, making sure um, that, that everybody knows what's going on. And if you don't, um, you know, you can, you can really upset some people. And so I would say that's another, that's another pitfall. Okay. okay. Um, those are, those are great things to watch out for as you're getting going in this communication, a hundred percent, making sure that you're communicating with your, your guests, with your property managers, with your contractors, with the people that you're buying the property from and especially your partners, because you want that to be a long-term relationship with your partners. And so. you know, one, one thing that absolutely applies in short-term rentals, but it also applies in any business setting is it takes years to establish a solid reputation and it only takes seconds to destroy it. So Connor has, has talked totally. about how dedicated and, and focused he is on creating a positive guest experience and auditing, you know, the property regularly to make sure that everything is, is on the up and up, but you just create one negative experience <laughs> that one time it can take years and years of effort and just make it, send it all crashing down. So it's important to, I will, to keep that in mind. To go along those lines, man, I still remember our first one star review. Um, and it destroyed me because we, in my opinion, of course, we had done everything right. And uh, it does, it takes, it takes time to recover from a one-star review and you have three five-star reviews and one, one-star review, you know, what does that take it down to? Like you're now to three-star review and you're like, your total reviews and you're like, oh man, we look terrible. Um, I would give, how do I say this? One of my pieces of advice is don't take it personally. Um, cause crap can happen. 
Don't, and I, this is, I'm saying this because this is my biggest weakness. And this is one of the reasons I love working with the Havens. We'll have guests that are irate over the silliest things. And I'm just like, you are being ridiculous. I'm, I'm not going to give in to what you're demanding. Like the, the 2 a.m. toilet paper roll issue, right? Like we have toilet paper stored in a shed in the driveway and they refused to go out to the shed to get it. They wanted us to come down, get it out of the shed and give it to them. And I'm like, get out of my place. That's my first reaction, <laughs> like is taking it personal. Yeah. And, and frankly, this comes into all business, right? Don't take it personal guys. Crap's going to happen when you're, when you're working with a partner, they might show up and be like, dude, I expected the rehab to look better or, you know, and, and don't take things personal. Um, be able to, to take a step back, put yourself in their shoes and really think about, you know, again, how you can continue to provide value. Um, but crap's going to happen, but do your best to, uh, to, or are always, you know, maintain your integrity and, and do what's right. Okay. Exactly. In, in closing, Connor, could you kind of give us name your top three must do's things that you'd say, okay, if you're looking at getting into short-term rentals, top three must do pieces of advice that you have for our listeners. Yeah, man, top three pieces of advice. So I've mentioned the one already, you have to take action guys. Um, you're going to be learning. Uh, so you're going to have, first you have to take action. The second one is you have to learn because if you're just out taking action, you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off. Um, and if you're just learning, you're never making money. And so go out and take action, but do these two, do one and two in conjunction with each other. As you're learning, implement. You don't get too ahead in your learning to where you're like, oh, well, now I got to go back to all the way back to what I learned at the very beginning, right? It's learn, do, learn, do, learn, do, right? Little, little by little together. Um, and then and I, I've mentioned this as well. My, my last one is absolutely provide value. That's number three. Um, you have to provide value. Um, I know we haven't talked really a whole lot in like the Airbnb setup and stuff um, because I, I have my management company do a lot of that, but um, th this very much applies to Airbnbs. Provide value to your guests. Your guests are going to be happy if they show up. One of the little things we do in every one of my units is a waffle iron and a bag of waffle batter or powder, whatever that stuff's called. Um, it's a little thing. But I cannot tell you how many of my reviews mention the waffle iron and the waffle and syrup. And it costs me like 10 bucks a month per unit. Right. Wow. And it's, but is it a value add? It is. So it's, it's things like that, that um, when you're providing value, you'll make a lot more money. So what you're saying is you're buying your five-star reviews with waffles. <laughs> with waffles. We're not above bribery. Syrup. <laughs> we're not absolutely not that is awesome well thank you so much connor for joining us today it's been a pleasure i uh, it's been a ton of fun for me too thank you yeah it's been incredible diving into the strategy with you and if you guys got value from today and you want to learn how to connect with connor uh, we're gonna put his email in the comments of the this episode but I'm going to say it out loud. It's Z-N-O-C Enterprises at gmail.com. But you can also find the link to that email in the comments below. And feel free to connect with him if you want to learn how to do more of this stuff. Um, Ryan and I can also help in that area as well. But this has been awesome today, Connor. Um, yeah. Maybe we'll have you on again. I'd love to. Look at that. Yeah. Commitment right there, and it's recorded, Ryan. <laughs> yes. Now you can't go. Now you can't renege on it. You can't go back. You've got to do it. Yeah. Sweet. So awesome. Now remember, guys. Ryan touched on this at the beginning of the episode. We do have our free seven-day Champion Hustle Quick Start Boot Camp. Go ahead, jump into our website at championhustle.com, and and check that out. Get access to that, and use that to level up your business. And next week. We're going to be covering the one attribute that separates the stagnant from the successful. It's going to be good. You don't want to miss it. We're excited. Have a great week, everybody. See you then. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Champion Hustle Podcast. 
For more great content and to join our online community, visit us at championhustle.com. Mm-hmm.